We're now joined by Johnny D from Brittany Fox. How are you, Johnny? I'm doing great, Jay. How are you? Uh, doing fantastic, man. Anticipating you guys coming to blow up the Sunset Strip again. Uh, I, I know I just got the phone with Billy, and he talks about, of course, coming out here recording the Bite Down Hard album and, and, and all that. But what was what was it like for you to come out to Hollywood for the first time and, and, and see all the, the musical greats and just feel that energy out here? Well, I came out there uh, way early, I mean, before the Britney days, and uh, I had been out there just on a, a scouting mission. I was playing in a band back in Philly with uh, John Karabi, who went on to play with the Scream and Motley and Union and all. I'm sure you're familiar with him, but we were in a band called Fragile back in Philly, and uh, I had gone out to L.A., check it out uh, with a couple friends and I um, man I was just like this is the place the energy so much was happening there at the time and this was before anything major down in Philly just incomparable uh, to any place else you know it was just, yeah that's that's LA you know Hollywood Whole another world yeah and so I came back with these wide eyes and I tried to get the band to like immediately move to LA and they were all like what dude we got jobs and wives and blah 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 and you know so I was like about a few months later or a year later I was just like I've got to move on this thing's gonna just sit here and uh, no, no hard feelings or anything, but I joined another band, and then like a year later, those guys ended up moving to L.A. anyway. So they were playing the strip and all that. Never, I never experienced uh, playing the strip mm -hmm. so much as uh, just you know, kind of hanging and enjoying it, and uh, it's just really cool. I mean, I was just out there again with Doro. It's changed yep. immensely, but uh, you know, there's still something about. LA that's just uh you know to come from the east coast and you know the sunshine the the women the music uh everything is just yeah the history like you know? yeah man all of it and that's that fires you up and uh we're you know I'm thrilled to be playing the whiskey you know legendary venue right on the strip I mean that's remained oh, yeah everybody from Led Zeppelin to ACDC's played there over the years I know it's it's crazy. Judas so Priest, definitely. everybody. But, yeah, no, it, it, people come to L.A. and they expect rock stars and movie stars to be standing on the corner. But we all know it. It goes down behind closed doors, you know, all the right. studios and the animators and the filmmakers and the recording studios. You know, it's it's still alive, even if they're not hanging out on the Sunset Strip every night. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I know you've had an incredible career, you know, coming up. Uh, of course, Billy talks about when you were – in, in the basement with him before any of this. So to come full <laughs> circle, it's got to be amazing. But to join Pete Way, the legendary UFO bass player, and his band Wasted, uh, I know you were a UFO fan, but what, oh, what was absolutely. it like to now all of a sudden be thrown into uh, this UK band and being led by the hard party in Pete Way? <laughs> well, I, I mean, surreal at first and just like, amazing as well i mean it was all happening so fast for me that i didn't get a chance to really uh you know realize what was going on but i just kind of i'm like okay they accepted me in i must be good enough and uh everything's cool so let's ride it you know and uh it was just like boom 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 one thing after another i mean the first gig i did was at the legendary marquee club in london um, was a showcase for EMI, sold out gig. You know, they were looking to see the band they were about to sign. Steve Harris from Maiden was instrumental in getting the band back up and running on a major way. You know, we had a lot of help from the Iron Maiden uh, infrastructure, you know, yep. lawyers, managers, travel agents, all this big time shit that I wasn't, you know, I was just like, what is going on? Where am I? You know, I think I landed on Mars or something. But, uh, you know, a couple months before that, looking at these guys in Kerrang! magazine, and then all of a sudden I'm on stage with two guys from UFO who I'd seen a bunch of times and being a fan, sure. playing that music, and then also, uh, the guys from Maiden coming up on stage and jamming with us. I mean, it was just like, talk about, you know, an immediate rush. It was just absolutely 
great. And being in another country, England, all this kind of history there, the Marquee, the Who, you know, oh, yeah. all the bands that had played there. I mean, it was just almost like the same energy we're talking about in, in Hollywood, you know, but on sure. a different scale. So uh, ch- Childhood dream, no doubt. Absolutely. I'm and sure you were learning every shape. every day from, from these veterans. Totally, totally. Learning uh, what to do and what not to do in a lot of ways. Oh, absolutely. You got to avoid the, great. you know, the pitfalls. Now, how yeah. how did that evolve into joining the great Doro Pesh, who you've uh, been with since '93? That's correct. Yeah. Um. That all came uh, post Britney Fox. Um. I had actually played with my. One of my best friends, James Delella, Jimmy Delella, keyboard player, guitar player, uh, who I'm in wasted with. He was instrumental in getting me uh, into that gig. Ended up back in Jersey, Philadelphia, and auditioned for Doro when she was hanging locally. And next thing you know, you know, five years later, he's hooking me up with an audition. And we end up playing together in Doro's band. This was like a year after Britney kind of decided to take a take a hiatus, you know. 93, so I'm, um, you know, make friends with Doro, another legendary rock star, you know. I'm just sure. like, you know, vibed very well with her. And as you can, you know, probably guess, 22 years later, I'm still really great friends with her and we've been around the world countless times and just she's a fantastic person and an amazing artist and uh i'm you know very proud to have uh stayed that long and and be able to keep a gig and and you know be around great people and they're just like very very normal well, like we say, on stage, you know, it takes a monster and, you, you know, just a larger-than-life character. But, you know, what what can you say about Doro, the person off stage that has allowed her to be top of her game for this many years and be, be one of the only females who's really been able to do what she's done? Yeah, I think she, you know, she withstood the, the early uh, pitfalls and, and roadblocks and just kind of had a, you know, a kick-ass attitude from the very beginning she knew it would be rough but according to her she never really looked at herself as a you know as a female or an underdog or whatever she just did what she felt in her heart and uh you know she all that early stuff is so honest whether she was you know speaking english correctly or not she was kicking serious ass trying to to get better all the time and i think she did she taught herself english you know, first time she came to America, she could barely speak any English at all. They were writing words in English, which they sometimes didn't even know what the hell they were talking about. Oh, this sounds cool. Burning the witches. Let's go. You know, and uh, just really awesome. But I think the thing that held uh, her feet on the ground has just been the love of music and uh, the love of her fans and the appreciation for her fans, which she to this day um will say that's top on her list and she says it every day she will never ever let that become secondary and that's something that you don't really you know see lasting very long you know people get complacent and they kind of uh fans become a pain in the ass or whatever but uh, she never says no to anyone you know unless there's a dangerous uh situation or something like that Mm -hmm. um she's she's just fantastic man she's a she's a true real you know honest soul and very kind and just you know to keep that balance between being a rock star or an artist or whatever and trying to keep the real doro inside is definitely difficult but man she you know committed to that well if if you master it and and she's certainly one of them and for for a band that's taking you around the world, uh, I know a lot of people from America here have never left their hometowns, and of course, we've got the greatest country here, but l- for those that haven't traveled to Germany, talk about what a great country that is, and what an amazing rock scene they have, and we all know the Scorpions, but tell, tell us a little bit yeah. about those that haven't traveled to Germany. Uh, I've really, you know, I've had a love affair with Germany since I've 
got to, you know, the first time I went there. I mean, it's, um, I mean, the history alone, obviously, um, and the the age of of all the architecture and the you know the, there's beautiful areas in Germany, um, the countryside, the mountains, forests, the autobahn where you be able to drive without a speed limit. Now, like everywhere else, and uh, there's traffic jam everywhere. But 20 years ago, I mean, it's like a you know, a fantastic fairy tale for me. But uh, uh, I think it, it was really cool to go w- just when things were kind of going under here for rock and roll. I mean, we're talking 92, 93, the whole grunge scene mm-hmm. um, blowing up everything and, and heavy metal or rockers were running scared and not knowing what to do and cutting their hair and all this crap. And I end up over in Germany and I'm like, holy shit, you know, it's like uh, 1986 all over again. And uh, I just, at that time, they were a little bit behind and they were really so appreciative of any band that would come over there and play for them. And they're so loyal and this could be Europe in general. I mean, the fans will um, just hang, you know, they don't care. Oh, you know, whereas here, if you have a record that doesn't do so well, people kind of like back off a bit over there. It's like, you know, they know all the songs on records that didn't do anything commercially. It's like, wow, man, you know, these people are actually really paying attention and they're really loyal. You know, to go to different countries around you, you know, we've been to Russia about many times, you know, um, just seeing that reaction from people who maybe grew up in a time when uh, you couldn't even purchase an album in Russia, for example. You had to borrow your friends who bought it on the black market and kind of trade it around for a couple weeks. And here's this woman who you saw in a magazine and like fell in love with, put it on your wall. And now all of a sudden she's playing a concert there. I mean, you literally see all of this on people's faces as you're performing. And it's, it's amazing, man. She gets like, you know, just covered in flowers during gigs when we play there. And they're so passionate. Well, we love that deep passion. And I know they have it in South America and so, so many great places. I'm sure you've, travel to but take us back to those glory days of Britney Fox coming out because I know again that era with Bon Jovi and Cinderella blowing up in, from the east coast and of course Poison yep. and Motley Crue and GNR and Dokken and everybody sure. from the west coast I mean it was a an incredible time and you guys you know got got that deal with CBS Records and made the girl school video T- talk about you know the exciting days of uh getting that deal and and stepping up to the big leagues it was pretty amazing i mean it was uh it all felt like it could go at any moment i know the guys did you know a lot of uh prep work before i joined the band but i was around at that time i mean these are all friends of mine who i've been in and out of other bands with playing the same venues with back in philly and jersey at the time so you know, I was mixed into that sauce, you know, whether, uh, you know, whatever bands were playing around the Philly at the time. So everybody was kind of just high on it because, you know, like you said, Bon Jovi had blown up. They were right across the bridge in Jersey. Cinderella got help from them and then they took off and they were a great band, which everybody in Philly uh, would, would have liked to model themselves after or like we need to like that because that's what uh you know that's what people want to see and so uh it was just a great time you know we had lots of places to play we had a lot of people to come out and and dig it you know we're playing the good crowds in local hometown venues i mean it was never really the the in thing you know it was always like okay uh we're the hard rockers or the heavy metal heads, you know, we're cast out to the suburbs or whatever it may be. You know, we weren't like, there wasn't a lot of availability uh, in the city as much, but uh, it didn't matter because people would travel if they had to drive, you know, two hours to a place to see bands that they would do it. 
uh, people, you know, are a little less into doing those types of things now. It's just, um, but you know, we, uh, when I joined the band right out of wasted, those guys called me and he said, you know, wasted had come to a halt for me. Um, Paul Chapman was fired and they, we were auditioning new guitar players and I was kind of questioning what's going to happen from here. Are we going to get dropped? All that. I get a call from Brittany guys. Um, you know, we're changing drummers. We got a deal, blah, blah, blah. I said, uh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm back home, you know? Mm. So, uh, I flew back, had one jam with them and, uh, they said, yeah, let's do it. And next thing you know, it was another rocket ride for me. I was like, you know, playing these gigs, learning songs on the, on the fly a couple weeks later in the venues to sold out crowds, uh, tons of kids, all ages shows, which were fantastic. You know, you didn't have to worry about a bar crowd and all that. And then, uh, you know, we're in the studio, we're cutting tracks. All was very natural. We weren't like a fabricated band by the label or anything like that. It all was packaged and ready to go, which was really cool. I think a lot of bands weren't as fortunate because they were maybe missing some elements. And then when you get a label involved, they try to make you into something that you might not be comfortable with or something you're not and changing songs. And so for Britney, it was, it was cool because we had a, an A&R guy that believed in it. You know, basically they had to plug us into the system and we would light up, you know? So uh, we did the record, record came out. You know, we did a video for Long Way to Love. We got our fans calling and requesting. That thing got on MTV, fan support. That was one thing we had. We had a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of fan support. We had, a, you know, a fan club. We had a lot of um, little articles and fanzines around the world. So we had sold a few thousand demos of the first In America tape locally. And uh, so that helped us get a get a, a foot in the door at MTV and they were like these guys have a built-in following already it's kind of like what they want from bands nowadays you know they don't yeah. want to just sign somebody that's unproven so you know and next thing you know we're like uh, on MTV and poison calls and they're like we want to take this Britney Fox band out they're from our area blah 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 so we get on that tour and shit just started blowing up for us from that point on you know next thing you know uh, we're playing arenas and making more videos and we're traveling in a tour bus. I mean, it was like a dream sequence, you know, next sure. thing we have a gold album. It's like, are you kidding me? You know, and we're just riding, riding the wave. Um, well, you had that experience too, from going to the UK and being with wasted and the, the maiden experiences and all that. You could bring back your childhood friends there that, you know, even though you're coming back to the hometown band, you, you kind of had your, you know, extra experience that you could offer to them. Yeah, I mean, uh, they definitely had their shit together as far as, like, you know, writing and, um, you know, stage uh, personas or, or you know, um, just attitude-wise. But, uh, yeah, as far as opening up into the big leagues, they, they hadn't done it. And I think that one two rounds for me just gave me the extra confidence to push further and bring, you know, bring that to these guys and uh, just help be, you know, one more element that could make it all that much better. I've always been a team guy, you know what I mean? I've never been uh, that, you know, out for myself. I realize drums are, are, are part of a, you know, a unit and um, I always try to keep a, keep a handle on that you know and that's what uh, i think the people that i've played with appreciate they want somebody that's you know up to their level of you know if you have four or five equal people all putting out the same uh you know level of of music or emotion or you know attitude i mean then it just makes the whole thing fire on all cylinders you know you have one bad cylinder you're going to kind of put down the road but uh it's really was cool to add you know to join in on something that actually had something going and then to bring yeah. like even more potential to that was was awesome 
Well, I know uh, Billy told us about the making of the girls' school video. You guys fly out to L.A. and there's the big sound stage and all the crew and the catering and the and all the girls and the hair and makeup and all that. I know that was yeah. quite a, a, a long ordeal to pull all that off. But talk about the joy and feeling you had the first time you saw the finished video and then saw it on MTV. What was that like? That was just fantastic because that is our second video i mean long way to love was cool for what it was but it didn't really have any story to it or not the girl school was like a you know anything i mean fun you know and uh you can see you know from from start to finish it feels like a, a small little, like you get your impression of what's happening here. It's, you, it's funny, it's sexy, it's kick-ass, it's all these elements, and I think they did a great job. Climbing up the MTV, uh, you know, viewing charts and, uh, and being in the top ten every day and just the energy. I remember watching, like, the early cuts on the tour bus while we were still on tour and um, just feeling like, man, you know, this is awesome. I wish, it, you know, I hope it never ends or whatever like that. Just kind of uh, enjoying every moment, you know, and uh, it was all good back then. I mean, it was like there was nothing, nothing that could stop us at that point. And uh, I thought they did a killer job on that video, especially like this is me any computer graphics or any green screen stuff. I mean, they literally did that with all the old school techniques of, uh, you know, a painted scrim. If you pay attention to the back wall where the chalkboard is, it was a painted canvas scrim, which when lights shined on it, it became see-through. And so the band was set up behind it. And, uh, you know, when the girls finally see the band uh they shine all the floodlights on this thing and it be basically did, made the wall disappear it was so f really interesting to see how it was all done and all the techniques and stuff and uh of course you had you know beautiful girls running all around and uh just you know it was a great day for a video set i mean it can become pretty uh tedious you know like I mean, anybody would say, hey, I would love to make a video rather than sitting at my job all day. What are you talking about? But, you know, it is a long day. You're not always on camera. You're kind of waiting for shots and doing this and that. But we were really busy that day. We were doing photo shoots and doing interviews and just busy. And that whole that whole video just brings back really a lot of good good memories for me. Well, I'm sure it was like shooting a little movie, you know, with that kind of cast and crew and production yep. and post and yeah, and all that. And I, I remember, of course, the first time we see the band in that shot with that little choreographed move where the three three guys up front are moving in unison. I mean, yeah. it's spine tingling. It reminds me of the first time I saw Poison coming out of here from Pennsylvania. And, they had right. they had a move, they had their moves you know and yeah. people love that when people are in sync they're 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 like there's there's a thought rather than just guys standing there jamming yeah it creates some kind of uh, energy you know even if you free or whatever like you said come up to the front of the stage and all stand together i mean it's like it creates a you know, just a cool vibe. I mean, Kiss proved that years ago. Any sure. kind of uh, choreography was was like, wow. You know, you're you're actually watching, you know, something different than a bunch of guys staring at their shoes or whatever. Or you know, and uh, a lot of people like that. I know I do. And uh, that was kind of what we we wanted to model ourselves after, or and like Kiss and AC/DC, and just have. Uh, have some showy bits and, you know, to go along with good songs, anthems, you know, positive, uh, positive messages, stuff like that. And, uh, just, you know, it was all about having fun, man. The eighties were nothing but fun. Yeah. Well, I know you got your friend Ricky Rocket on the Bite Down Hard album. So I know there was synergy and I'm sure you were, you got a chance to learn some, some things, some poison going out on the road with them. And they were young guys kind of from, 
Pennsylvania originally, and you know, it's uh, it's that camaraderie that's so important. It was really cool, man. Those guys, I'm still friends with Rick, and he's just a great dude. And uh, when they brought us out, they pretty much proved that they weren't going to do uh, some of the, you know, some of the negative stuff that was done to them. I mean, jealous bands or whatever, and uh, giving them limited stage space or sound or lighting and all this kind of stuff. You can't go here. Don't look over there. Don't even think about touching that and blah, blah, blah. They were like, just go the fuck out there, kick ass, warm the crowd up. And, you know, it just makes a better evening for everybody, really. So uh, that was very cool. And uh, you now the Pennsylvania camaraderie was awesome. And uh, we also, yeah, learned from them because they, you know, they stepped it up miles when they went to california you know so they were sucking up some of that vibe and bringing it back you know bringing sure. it back east or around the world or whatever and uh you know we were all we were all checking that out sure well i i know you've got a long legacy of, of loving bands and being influenced by some people if we could do a quick little uh word association i'm gonna throw a band out and just t- tell them what what they means what they mean to you and you know what? What they mean to the history of rocks. When we talk about Kiss and Peter Chris, what comes to mind? Uh, for me, uh, probably the the reason why I decided to do this. Um, I had, you know, you see drummers uh, growing up, and you know, I was fascinated by drums, you know, and I was fascinated by drummers after that, and then I was just like knocked the hell over by Peter Chris because not only he just had a swagger, a swing, I loved the music. Um I thought he was great whether people, you know, you want to be like technically like okay, is he the best ever? No, but he had a charisma, he had his own sound, he had obviously nobody looked like him. Um you know, and I mean, it was a, a, a life changer for me to see them and uh, to be, you know, that kind of mystique where you have four guys in a band, each guy has a character, you know, they're kind of like the Beatles, like our Beatles for uh, for my generation, you know, although I love the Beatles as well, and I was a little late. Uh, on that game, but uh, I mean, you can't deny it. I mean, it's just. Uh, I mean, love or hate Kiss. I mean, the catalog, the perseverance, the fact that they're doing this, going on like 50 years later, is insane. Yeah, it's it's unbelievable, and it's hard to uh, now to stand here where I am now with like the fan. You know, I like to say my fan brain and my uh, my music business brain on the other side going like fighting each other like. I love Kiss. I hate Kiss. Look at what they've become. So what, man? They're still doing, you know. So it's it's not easy when you a band lasts that long. It's like holy crap, you know. I mean, we're not used to, you know, our our heroes uh, being so you know long in the business or whatever. You know, a lot of the bands I like broke up after five years, and there's like this reverence that you can't really touch them anymore. You know, you can just listen to the records. You don't have to hear them on Twitter, you know, bullshitting about something that you don't care about. You know what I mean? It was just like, uh, you know, this is the way it used to be. And that's cool. There's part of me that misses that. But I also know the reality of everything. And that's, you know, that's how it is. I mean, if you want to survive, you have to do certain things. And that's... uh, you know, every band gets into this game because they want to do that, you know. And if they say they don't, they're probably full of shit, you know. Nobody wants to get in the business and then quit after a year. Um, well, they certainly so, have to, you know, keep moving, and not everyone's going to agree with every move. But I always say the Beatles, and of course they were the all-time songwriters, but they started at the same time the Stones did, but the Beatles broke up before 1970, and the Stones are still doing it unbelievable man you know and you hear all the stories you know that they hate each other they're just doing another tour for the money and blah 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 they don't need it but i mean fucking hey man that's the fucking stones those guys were there in the beginning 
and they're still doing it. And, you know, you just got to give it up to them for that fact alone. Now, whether you want to spend a thousand bucks on a ticket, that's a whole different story. But, you know, the that's fact that they're still playing it. stadiums well over 50 years into it is unbelievable. Right. Yeah. Just the power of that music is just is uh, it's just amazing. And what can you say about ACDC? Again, another legendary band um, stuck to their guns probably more than any effing band in history. You know what I mean? Those guys never, ever changed for anybody's, you know, for any trend, anybody's insistence, managers, record companies. It's just one big middle finger. Uh, we're ACDC, and that's what the fuck we are, and they survived a, a major, major tragedy with Bon Scott uh, dying, and man, what a great fucking front man he was, and a great singer, and then here comes, you know, the second wave of their career, and now they're still going all these years later, and uh, it's just a testament to music and commitment you know from these guys to just keep keep at it and keep cranking out the the rock and roll you know they're showing everybody you know what what the real deal is you know not you can't say that about many bands yeah i remember when they first came out i was in the industry and people didn't know because punk was taken off and it's like this raw band from australia we don't know are they punk or is this metal right. What what is this? And they never fit in with anyone. They they were only ACDC. They never were exactly. in anybody's scene. Yeah, man. They just did their own thing, you know, heavy boogie, and uh, but you know would slice your face off. I mean, they were vicious in the beginning. They were just like, <laughs> you know, and the and the just the the way they. Uh, the way they approached it, like they were, they didn't care whether they looked comical or like a bunch of misfits or whatever it was, they were going to do whatever it took them to get attention and they weren't going to do anything, you know, out of their reach of rocking the shit out of any crowd they were in front of. And that's what, um, you know, that's kind of, missing in certain ways you know now people yeah. come out and it's basically every performance is exactly the same as the last one and um yeah there's energy but it's a different kind of energy you know back then it was you know angus running around and you know going out in the crowd and on someone's shoulders and just doing crazy shit man people you know now it's all about oh you know, we can't get insurance for that, and you can't do this, and you can't do that. But, uh, you know, those guys were pioneers, man, and they just they just knocked down every barrier that was, was set in front of them. So, sure. cool. I'm glad I got to, you know, to witness that. Amazing, amazing music, stuff. Man. Well, speaking of the Americans, what, what can you say, a band, uh, say about a band like Aerosmith? Uh, another legendary band that kind of modeled themselves after what they grew up on, took the best bits of, you know, of the Stones or, you know, um, and just kind of made it their own. You know, they, they threw it all in a pot and made their own stew out of it. They were lucky enough to have, you know, a maniac like Tyler and, uh, freak, you know, on on steroids and just, you know, the writing, the songwriting improved all the time. And uh, another band just out there, boom, hit the road, win over crowds, come huge and just keep doing it, you know. I mean, drugs and all that, you know, came in. and But, I mean, you can't deny they're one of the biggest, baddest, you know, ever and uh you know it's uh definitely respect to them for that well they always had deep roots too you, you you could just feel the soul and the funk and the rhythm and blues and, the, and that deep blues you know in in what they did why is it important for bands to have have some deep roots and not just listen to what's out now i think 
Um, because it translates. I mean, it translates to uh, people. It's not like a, you know, a top level thing. It's down to your balls and your groin. I mean, it's like when you see something that coming from that deep in some pit of their stomach or their soul or their guts or their, you know, background, you know, bluesy rock always had uh, some kind of grounds, you know, it was deep and dirty and it had, you know, it's got a base to it. Now you got, you know, all this kind of very uh, abrasive, mechanical sounding stuff. And it's, uh, it's a different feeling, you know, it's more cerebral, not as much of a physical connection, um, just like, you know, a fat, chunky Les Paul sound uh, with some big-ass speakers moving air on a stage as opposed to a guy plugged into a, you know, a little 4x4 four four box that's making a guitar simulated sound. I mean, it's, come on, you can't compare it. Sure. And uh, it's really just a whole different thing, but... Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, like we we say, you know, we we live through that, and somebody that's growing up now may not necessarily know that, you know, they may not get it. Maybe some people are more receptive. A lot of people turn their kids on to the old shit, and they mm-hmm. suck it right up. My buddy took his kids to see Van Halen, uh, you know, ACDC, and they're just like sucking it all in. Paul McCartney, like all the old you know, the old guard, pretty soon that shit won't be around anymore. No, we need to keep growing those legends. And and a couple more, speaking of those that are super underrated, but those that are in the know can't get enough of it, and you guys have covered both of them. How about Nazareth and Dan McCafferty? Hmm. Oh, my God. Unbelievable, man. I mean, the guy just retired. I We did a gig with them in, in Wales. Uh, they have Carl Senton's. Uh, singing for them now but I mean sure. those tunes legendary I mean what a voice uh, you know the writing Love Hurts you know uh, Rasmin as Hair of the Doll I mean just you know these are bands that were able to develop over time and uh, you know perfect their craft and now you know it's way different you know you don't have that kind of development time you don't have there's too much pressure on, you know, numbers and, you know, uh, figures and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, these guys were just out there fucking getting their hands dirty and doing it, you know. And, uh, Paying the dues. Yeah, man. And that's the way, you know, build up a following. People totally appreciate that. They're like, these guys are out there kicking ass working. And you may not even have even heard of them, you know. Well, through your covers and, of course, Axl Rose, a lot of people slash. They, they're big fans of those guys. They never let yeah. that music die. And how about a band that was super underrated here in America, but I remember when they first came over, like Aerosmith was opening for them. How about a band like Slade? Yeah, yeah Slade, man. Just uh, the kings of anthem rock, you know? Unbelievable. I mean, Quiet Riot had what? Two back-to-back... Back in, right. Back to the back first up. two albums oh, were man. led by a Slade cover. Unbelievable, man. You know, of course, you man, guys did Goodbye to Jane. I mean, super underrated in America. You know, Run Runaway, yeah. all the great stuff. I know, great stuff. But they were, you know, they were part of that glam kind of movement thing, and I think a lot of people may as serious as you know some of the. Uh, you know, they were kind of a novelty, um, but, you know, you can't deny the music and the, uh, you know, Sweet is another one. Oh, Desolation Boulevard. I mean, Ballroom Blitz and Step yeah, Street, I mean, Fox on the so Run. What what an era. Heavy, super heavy, melodic. Uh, but, yeah, every band, to me, every band you name right now, every one of them, individual sound, look. You know, it was yeah. weird because a lot of people were doing the same, uh, in the same genre or scene, you know, they may have been dressing the same, but they certainly didn't sound the same, you know, and, 
you know, that's another element that uh, has sort of faded, you know? Sure. Well, Johnny, it's always a pleasure to talk music. I know we're turning some people on to some bands. They're going to love and they're going to thank you for talking about them. And of oh, course, man, we can't wait for you. Britney Fox to come out and blow up the Sunset Strip at the Whiskey coming up. And I know there's new music to come from you guys. And of course, we're always there next time you come through with Doro. So appreciate all the years of rocking you've given us. Can't wait to see you again. And of course, keep keep it up. Keep on rocking. Oh, yeah, man. We're in it for life, you know. Thank you as well.